Well, good evening, everybody, and a happy new year to all of you. Welcome on behalf of Milim to this evening's presentation, our very first of the new year. Welcome to you wherever you are in the UK and indeed wherever you are in the world. Now, our series of online talks and presentations continues with our guest Linus Bradis. I'll introduce Linus in just uh, a moment. But before I do that, a little bit of housekeeping. Please do ask questions. Uh, you can do this by typing whatever you'd like to ask into the Q&A facility uh, on your screen. And as always, we'll try our best to get through as many of your questions as we can. Let me also draw your attention to the chat facility. This will allow you to send a message to all of the other participants on this webinar, should you wish to do so. And finally, we are recording this presentation. It'll appear on the Millim website at millim.org.uk in the next day or so. There you will find details of other past events, as well as details of our programme coming up for which you can book tickets. Now, in 2023, this is the, the year where we've just entered, Lithuanian capital Vilnius will celebrate its 700th anniversary, and there'll be a string mm -hmm. of cultural, musical and artistic events uh, to that end. This talk uh, actually forms part of the upcoming anniversary programme. Following on from a live event a few weeks ago at the UHC Synagogue in Leeds, uh, Linus has kindly agreed to present his talk uh, online for those who are unable to attend. Now, some of you uh, tried to attend on a previous occasion and we were beset with technical problems. Hopefully we've ironed those all out and uh, you will be able to uh, hear the presentation uh, live very shortly. Now, Linus uh, Bradis is a writer uh, and a scholar of history, literature, and the geographical imagination of Lithuania. And although he's lived most of his life in Vancouver, Canada, from where he's joining us this evening, um, and from where he completed a, a doctoral degree in cultural geography at the University of British Columbia, he's actually a, a native of Vilnius. His creative output um, stretches from charting a GIS-anchored digital map of the multilingual literature of Vilnius to examining the ramifications of being bilocal, placing questions relating to belonging, migration, diaspora, translation, poetic vision, and memory at the core of his work. He's the author of Vilnius City of Strangers, reviewed by The Economist as being a subtle and evocative book, uh, where vanished civilizations and lost empires leave a city stalked by horror and steeped in wonder. The book has been translated into several languages, including German, Chinese, Russian, and Portuguese. It's my great pleasure to introduce Linus, who will speak about his work and his book with specific reference to the Jewish community of Vilnius. Linus, are you with us? It should be all right. He is there. We just had a few problems, but he is there. I'm just going to... Linus, you need to switch your camera on. Yes, yes. Uh, Got it. You're there. We're there. There we go. Thank you. Uh, I'm here and uh, <laughs> good to see you. And I'm sorry, but I think um, it's still some few problems are not resolved. So if you have a, I'm asking you to be patient and maybe it will take me two minutes to put uh, uh, screen, share. screen share. Yeah, so screen share, you'll be all right to do. So you universally shared your screen a moment ago. So if you just screen share as usual, you'll be able to carry on. And we'll leave it okay. to you. We'll be back to you when you finish speaking. Yeah, so there we go. So you should be sharing it now. That's it. You're not there quite. You need to start slideshow, I think. That's it. Okay. And start start slideshow. Okay. Stay from so. start, which is a bit further long to your to the left. Next one. Furthest one left. That's it. Yeah. That's it. There we so go. Everything now more or less in order, or you can you yep. hear me? Everything's there. Know? Everything's there as we practice. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> there you go. The uh, well, hopefully now. This, is, this is the third. Uh, well, this is the second trial in the in this format. So, but anyway, so thank you very much. So everything is working, right? So I can start. Yeah, please start. Please start. Okay. 
Uh, thank you for having me. And um, I'm going to talk today about the sort of relationship between Vilnius as the capital of Lithuania and also that the Vilnius that carries the sort of name Jerusalem of Lithuania. So uh, this is going to be a conversation of that we might talk about 700 years of history between these sort of kind of like diff different, if you want to call positions, Vilnius as the capital of Lithuania, but also kind of like the Vilnius of Vilna, as it's called in, in Jewish and Yiddish and Hebrew, of Vilna presentation or presence, so to speak, in, in Jewish life, culture, uh, and geography and history. So Vilnius is actually, when people ask me what's so important about Vilnius, then uh, I would say that Vilnius, one of the reasons why it stands out in a way from many other places in Europe, that has the same sort of multicultural perhaps aspect is that uh, surprisingly Vilnius really is near the epicenter of Europe, geographical center or geographical midpoint of Europe. And according to French uh, geographical calculations, French cartographical academy or, or something like that, uh, Vilnius is really situated about 26 kilometers south of the actual geographical center of Europe which is located near the village of Gidea, uh, which has population of 900 and Vilnius has about over half a million people. Uh, so it's a basically somewhere in the middle of nowhere, if you wanna call of Lithuania is the geographical center of Europe. Now in Lithuanian, the word Gidea literally means forest and woodland. So that gives you just a perspective of what Europe is perhaps, because it's like we assume that the center of uh, geographical center, at least if not necessarily some sort of historical narrative center should be somewhere much closer to to the sort of urban centers, perhaps even in Prague or Vienna or Budapest or something like that. But depends how you calculate where and what geographical center is. Vilnius is actually the closest city to this geographical center. So that makes perhaps the sort of the, uh, the look at the Vilnius from the perspective of the center is very different. And in a way, it's, um, it's a useful to think how Europe could be narrated as a whole uh, from the sort of midpoint of, of continent. And, and, and because in many ways, Vilnius has always been a sort of marginal part of Europe. It's a city marginalized. It doesn't play a very sim significant role um, in European history. But Vilnius was established as, as founded 700 years ago in theoretically in 1323, although I'm pretty sure that the some form of uh, settlement existed before. Uh, but what is interesting about Vilnius in terms of the rest of the sort of kind of the other regional cities, Riga, for example, Tallinn, and uh, that Vilnius was as founded as a capital city by a pagan ruler of the rapidly expanding Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which was already at the time a polylingual and multi-confessional state. Now, so this is the sort of kind of like the image of uh, from the Christian side of, the, of Vilnius as a, as a founded of the pagan place. Now, the first record of the city comes from 1,323 1, from the January 25th uh, letter sent by the ruler of this pagan ruler of Lithuania, Agediminas, uh, sent a letter to the Christian cities inviting all the people, and literally this is the quote from the letter, we invite all the people, priests, bishops, and religious orders, all, if, only, if only their lives are not corrupt, to come to our dominion. And in a way, it's a kind of like the, a statement of opening up Lithuania, opening up like Vilnius uh, for Europe. Now, it is a kind of symbolic day and for in the Christian calendar because it's the day of St. Paul's conversion. Uh, it's a really, really the day of road to Damascus, so to speak, uh, event. Uh, so it's the day of conversion uh, of uh, pagan to Christian. Uh, and Gediminas, the ruler of Lithuania, kind of promised that if everything works out, uh, you know, this conversion will happen and he would become Christian. However, when the papal representatives reach Vilnius next year, 
he actually renounced that sort of like, and he said, I never wrote like this. What, what this letter is not written by me, but it's written by my scriber, who is actually uh, just a Catholic monk. And actually he twisted my words. Yes, I did invite people uh, from all around the world, so to speak, to come to, to Vilnius, to Lithuania and settle there. But I never promised um, to convert to Christianity. And besides, he said, who, and he literally, that's what he said to the papal, papal de delegates. We, and, and who are the most, so to speak, um, against the peace as, as a Christ, than, than Christian people, so in a way. So kind of like he becomes upper state in many ways. So for almost a century, Lithuania was this kind of like unique country, all surrounded by Christian countries and powers. Uh, that resisted Christianization. And finally, Christianization came into Vilnius in, uh, in 1387, uh, when Lithuania and Poland sort of kind of like became uh, uni unified in a, in a marriage, literally between Lithuanian ruler and Polish and Polish ruler. Uh, but the legend of the Vilnius founding is kind of resonates in, in many ways. Uh, and the Vilnius, the legend of Vilnius founding is that the Gediminas was dreaming about to establishing, so to speak, this great city. And, and this foundation was built on some kind of mercy, giving the city to people. So, so this is just an example, for example, how it is resonates in, in Jewish narrative. So we have a wonderful poem of Vilna by Yiddish writer Moshe Kulbach, written in 1926, which kind of compares the city to a Kabbalist dream. O city, you are the dream of a Kabbalist, gray drifting in the universe, cobweb in the early autumn. But also you are dark amulet set in Lithuania, figures smolder faintly in the restless stone, lucid white sages of a distant radiance, small hard bones that were polished by toy. And here's another example of the way describing this or like repossessing this Lithuanian narrative, if you want to go uh, like uh, of, of the founding of the city and placing in, into very familiar Jewish narrative by Abba Kovner, who was the uh, one of the, the leader of the partisan movement in Vilna Ghetto and also became quite instrumental in setting up and establishing the state of Israel. This is what he wrote in 1972, this city meaning Vilnius with his foundation of mercy was Prince Gediman's city. The river was Vilia, and that's where the name of the Vilnius comes from. She wasn't just Gedimina's city. She was Vilna, my mother city. Uh, now, if we look at the Jewish community, it's very hard to pinpoint exactly the date, for example, when the Jewish community started. Right? Now, we know that in Lithuania, which again was much larger uh, entity, territorial entity than today's Lithuania, that there are, uh, there are already records of, of Jewish communities established in various towns in Lithuania, Troki, Garden, et cetera, et cetera, already in the, in the 14th century. But according to the tradition, to the local tradition, the old Jewish cemetery of Vilna, which is actually across the city from the old town, uh, was laid out in, in 1487. So there's no really actually concrete evidence of that. And most likely that cemetery was set up much later, maybe 100 years later. But nonetheless, the tradition of Jewish tradition, in a way, in, 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 in places that the, the first kind of visible evidence of the Jewish, Jewish presence in Vilnius was from the 15th century. Um, so now we have to switch a little bit and to look at what the presence of Vilnius meant for Europe. And, and one of the most significant events that actually pretty much resonates with the contemporary Europe was the Battle of Orsha in 1514 on September 8, when Lithuania and Poland was fighting against Moscovy, which Russia did not exist at. They only have like Grand Duchy of Moscow. And if you can see on the map, Lithuania was one of the largest countries in Europe, literally stretching from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. Most of what is today's Ukraine, Belarus, and Western Russia um, belong to this country. So the Battle of Orsha was somewhere where near Smolensk. Uh, so it's already it's already in the in the region in the area of 
um, what is today considered to be Belarus, but also kind of like closer to Russia. And the Battle of Orshas, the significance was that was that the Russian army, the Moscow army was defeated. Uh, and that word, so to speak, of, of the Moscow army defeat, defeat, defeat spread all over the Europe. Now, kind of, you know, prisoners, war prisoners were sent from Vilnius to, to Rome, to other places all around Europe, and all kind of, like, so to speak, victory souvenirs. However, the the victory was sort of did not deliver, so to speak, the the promised results because eventually the Lithuanian Poland lost territory, especially the territory in the east, including Smolensk. But what is interesting in and what it tells you about sort of kind of Vilnius and Grand Duchy of Lithuania, that the that the head of the Lithuanian army was Duke Os Ostrogoshki, which uh, now is commemorated as basically the liberator, in, if you want to call it, of Ukraine. Because he was Orthodox, Greek Orthodox. It's very important to point out that he was not Russian Orthodox, but the Greek Orthodox. Uh, so, so in a way, this was the essence of this of Vilnius and this old Grand Duchy that sort of managed to unite, if you want to call Catholics uh, and, and Greek Byzantine Orthodoxy against what was considered to be the threat. So in a way, it was build, building kind of this formula of Europe that we have today. Uh, so, so the September 8 is a big day, both in Lithuania and both in Ukraine, and uh, especially last year, I think it was commemorated as sort of kind of like in, in this, in, uh, in the reflection of the, what's going on in today's Ukraine in the mirror of Ukraine's war um, as the historical, uh, symbolic, uh, his, historical kind of victory over Moscow, which literally over Russia. But so just to give you an, another example of this kind of symbiosis of Vilnius between West and East, if you want to call, is that the first book was in, in Vilnius was printed in 1922. And it was a book printed in Cyrillic, in, in um, la alphabet, for more or less orthodox readers. Uh, and it was a, like pocket size road book, which means that like if somebody who is a traveling could read um, religious inspirational kind of like on every everyday religious inspirational uh, stories based on 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 Bible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was printed by somebody, Francisco Scorn, who was born in Belarus, but had a sort of education in Prague, and then went to Moscow to establish. Um, printing house but was chased away as a heretic from Moscow and settled in Vilnius and where he established this printing presence. Um, now at that time uh, Jewish community we have already evidence of Jewish community in Vilnius but also very importantly we have evidence of Karaites and Muslim Tatars who came from the Crimea again the Ukrainian territory today and settled in and around the city, Vilnius, uh, a century earlier, sometime like around 1400. Um, so it is important, Karaites and, and Muslim Tara presence is important because uh, Jewish community very often initially, where it was still small, shared the same sort of kind of social spaces, communal spaces, for example, cemeteries and even kosher, halal kind of a butchers, et cetera, with Karaites and, and um, and even Muslim Tatars. Uh, but by 1500, we kind of like evidence that the Jewish established community on its own. However, it is kind of important to know that Jews were expelled from the Grand Duchy from Lithuania from 14, 1495 to 1503. Uh, and this is probably following the expulsion of uh, Jews from Spain. So in the way Lithuanian ruler, Grand, Grand Duke Alexander kind of wanted to prove that he is also a very good Catholic and sort of he expelled. This was poorly enforced and most of the Jews sort of already settled in Lithuania. They left Lithuania, but so they set, resettled just, just on the other side, so to speak of the border in Poland. And when they were granted permission to come back in 1503, they pretty much all of them came back and they were giving back their old properties and, and sort of rights to uh, to trade, et cetera. 
But still, the, the citizens of Vilnius, the Christian citizens of Vilnius, were not necessarily unhappy with the situation, and they sort of asked the rulers to um, establish what the prohibition, what they call against Jews living on trading in the city in, 15, in, in, 12, in 1527. Now, once again, this wasn't really enforced very vigorously, uh, and already by by sort of mid 16th century, we have evidence of growing Jewish community. And this is kind of a list to place this kind of growth of the Jewish community, what was going on in, Lith in Vilnius and Lithuania and in Europe at the time. So in, 15, in 1563, we have the earliest records of an organized Jewish community, which means the community is now, we don't have individual Jewish sort of settlers, but a community pays taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So it deals with the authorities as a, in, as a community rather than individuals. Jewish. Now, next year, Jesuits arrived to Lithuania, and this is a very important point because up until then, Lithuania was pretty much very tolerant religiously because it has all these kind of combinations of religions, Protestantism, Orthodoxy, Catholicism, and Islam, etc. So it was religiously very tolerant, and the rulers in general were tolerant. Uh, but when, with the Jesuits' arrival, we have a Contra-Reformation. And Contra-Reformation, of course, kind of a spread intolerance to the others, uh, including to many, to some extent, to, to, to Jews. But nonetheless, in 1573, we have the evidence of the first wooden synagogue erected in the Jewish quarter of the city. Uh, but several years later, we have Jesuits Academy College, which later became University of Vilnius, so Vilnius University, quite important institution for Lithuania and for Vilnius. But it's also playing, especially in its early initial stage, about 200 years when it functioned as a Jesuit Academy, functioned really as a, as a source of a lot of sort of animosity against uh, different religious dominations. Uh, college students were actually notorious in sort of being a gang, a Catholic gang in this way, and sort of attacking both Lutherans, but also Jews. Uh, in 1592, we have a first mentioning of Jewish streets. So, so, so already it's clear that because usually in this place, all place like Vilnius, uh, streets where either have the you know, denomination of uh, the church, for example, or some kind of place, of city hall, palace, etc., or whoever lives on that street. So if we have a Jewish street, we, it's pretty much self-evident that this was a street inhabited by Jews. Interestingly enough, close to a German street, which was known for German merchants living there, and actually the first Lutheran Protestant church or whatever was established there. So in a way, Jewish street and German street actually intersected, and in Vilnius they intersect sort of kind of, and eventually, uh, interesting enough, by the sort of 19th century, German street becomes more or less Jewish street as well, so to speak, although it still carries the name Deitsche Street. Um, in 1610-1612, Polish-Lithuanian army occupies Moscow, and that also is quite very important because in many ways, uh, again, how it resonates in contemporary Europe and contemporary and what's going on war in Ukraine, because in the Russian narrative, this was the biggest, so to speak, and most devastating invasion, foreign invasion that occupied Moscow. So, so you can you can imagine that the sort of how it plays still in, in the mind of sort of in Russian rulers. Uh, now, Polish-Lithuanian army occupied Moscow and brought a lot of wealth, loot, basically, from, from Moscow. So they stripped the churches, et cetera, et cetera, in Moscow. And with that, in a way, uh, but partially with that, we have the sort of kind of like the perhaps the most glorious epoch in building of, of Vilnius is sort of kind of like when Baroque comes uh, into the city. And Baroque comes straight directly from Rome uh, with Jesuits. Uh, in the establishment to sort of a building of St. Casimir Church. And St. Casimir was a local patron. He was uh, uh, the, the son of the king of the, in the 15th century who died in Vilnius and he was canonized in late 17, early 17th century and sort of became a patron of Lithuania. 
and also Catholic patron of Lithuania, and also a uh, patron of, interestingly curious enough, of Russia, so to speak. So with this church, which was based, built on Il Gesù Church in Rome, we have a uh, Baroque coming to Vilnius and Lithuania. And again, this is quite important in part because because sort of Vilnius, it is Baroque city. It's not your traditional Baroque city. It's not as kind of like Rome or St. Petersburg uh, or Versailles, for example, it has these kind of alleys or whatever perspective. It's still medieval town, but it's with the Baroque elements. And most of the Baroque elements, of course, is this kind of like magnificent Baroque churches that is very in contrast to many sort of um, Baroque elements, that is, which is horizontal it's vertical. So domes and, and uh, uh, bell towers uh, dominate um, Vilnius landscape. So it's unavoidable that anybody who lives in the city uh, is, is surrounded by these kind of like Baroque churches and, and massive Baroque buildings. Now in, uh, in 1633, Vilnius Jewry is granted the Royal Charter privileges permitting to engage in all branches of commerce distilling Etc. any crafts not subject to the guilt organization, basically kind of some kind of non-union, if you want to place in the contemporary word, uh, world, and to build a stone synagogue, but restricting their place of residence. Uh, so initially, where Jewish community was confounded to the what, what it is really today is the heart of the old town, which is today it's called Jewish quarters. Uh, where, which was built around uh, this magnificent stone synagogue. And I'll talk about this synagogue a little bit later because one of the one of the aspects of the synagogue, of course, it was because it was built in the Baroque style or rebuilt in the Baroque. Style. So this is a, that sort of like late 16th century description of the city from somebody who is very obviously it's a Lutheran. Uh, other than like having a pool water bath and little beer, but in addition of, of the Lutherans, the Lutherans, the city, the city also has many sources of religions and sects, all of which have the churches, public exercises such as Papists, Calvinists, Jesuits, Ruthenians, which is kind of Orthodox, and Moscovites, Anabaptists, Zwinglians, and Jews, important to notice, also have the synagogue and place of gathering. Then there are also the heathens. I don't know what that he meant, meant. Maybe pagan Lithuanians still sort of kind of <laughs> worship some, some continue some kind of pagan traditions or Tartars and all the religions, companies and sects. And sects have liberty conscious. And this is very important, freedom on consciousness, which was sort of built into the, if you want to call constitution of Lithuanian Grand Duchy, in which no one is hindered. Uh, but overall, Vilnius was considered to be a wild frontier, literally, uh, of Europe, where the sort of still the city pretty much surrounded uh, by forests and wild beasts. Uh, and to get to Vilnius would take days, if not weeks, traveling through the forest. Also, the city still at that time was pretty much built of wood. Uh, so it wasn't kind of stone. So I think the so the stone as a building material for Vilnius only started to be in as a city rather than individual structures, only probably around sort of seven, beginning of the 17th century. Um, so, so here's the example of the Vilnius Baroque, of the sort of the great, great synagogue of Vilnius is on, on the top. Uh, unfortunately, because the great synagogue of Vilnius was built sort of uh, surrounded in this courtyard, Schulhof, uh, there are very few pictures, photographs of the great synagogue that you could see the entire building. So we actually, we don't really have the sort of the the, um, uh, the, the good imagery of, of the synagogue, in part also because synagogue was not allowed to be built higher than churches in the city. So it had actually literally in the church, if you go up, uh, for example, like in the St. Casimir church, then in the synagogue, you go down because actually it was sort of kind of like, I think, two story deep in the way in the basement or something like that. It was still had magnificent arches and it was very spacious, but it was but the entrance into the synagogue was actually going down rather than in churches going up. And I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit. And this is on um, 
uh, St. Casimir Catholic Church, but under the Tsar's rule in 19th century, it was turned into Russian Orthodox Church. And when the Germans occupied during World War II, World War I, uh, Vilnius, it was turned into Protestant Church and then turned back into Catholic Church and the Poles. Uh, but when I grew up in the Soviet Lithuania, it was turned into Museum of Atheism. So you can see that this sort of one building carries this legacy of many different religions, including, including atheism, which pretty much was more or less the official religion of the Soviet of regime, if you can call it a religion. Um, now in 1655-1661, Moscow's forces and Cossack forces uh, occupied Vilnius. And this was probably before the 20th century calamities was probably one of the most devastating uh, event in the history of city. Uh, here we have a description of, of Rabbi Moses Rivkes, uh, who wrote actually, um, who is from Vilna, but sort of wrote this as already being a refugee in Amsterdam, what happened when the Russians and the Cossack forces arrived. Whatever the Cossacks appeared, then they lost for spoil, seized all the belongings of the Jews, whom they slaughtered slaughter in masses. Uh, when, when the army spread alarm and terror approached the gates of Vilna, the, the governor of Vilnius, military governor of Vilnius, together with his troops quickly fled and many of the inhabitants of the city follow his example. On Wednesday, the 23rd of Tammuz, 54-15, almost the whole Jewish community ran for their lives like one man. Those who had horses and carts went, went went forth with their wives, sons and daughters and some of their belongings and others went on foot carrying their children on the shoulders. When I read this, basically I cannot, but to think about the today refugees from Syria and from, for example, today from Ukraine, basically like fleeing in, uh, uh, in, in a matter of, of minutes. Uh, so, but this was probably the first, uh, it's important also to mention that it's not just Jews actually, as I mentioned, like fled the city, but many, Christians uh, also fled the city. So this was basically the first uh, instance when we start to have a, if we want to call Vilna diaspora or Vilnius diaspora. As I mentioned, for example, Rabbi Moses Rivkes ended up in Amsterdam. So this is the first uh, diaspora that was forced from Vilnius, but sort of has a kind of, in this case, just a European, but later on the sort of global spread both, and it's important to mention, both Jewish, but also Christian uh, as well. So in the way Vilnius was from that late early age already from the 17th century was the city that sort of was, was always between um, these kind of like waves of immigration, forceful and not forceful. So in a way that's very important to keep in mind. And I think that's one of the strength perhaps and weakness uh, also of the city, that the, the, the city's population was constantly forced to move out. So in a way it takes the people to come in, but then also the, due to economic forces to kind of wars and all kinds of things, people are also forced to uh, move out. So in a way uh, it's always a city, if you want to call of immigrants, Although it's strange to say that, because in a way, also it's a very it's a very old city, so it has a very kind of like you know deep traditions of of all different communities present. But nonetheless, on the individual level, it's probably fair to say that it's always almost always been the city of immigrants. Uh, so in that, in the way, it's almost functioned as a metropolis uh, of of the region. Now, from then on. The city was in decline, and basically a century of the sort of famines, pestilence, wars, and fires, and plundering of different armies, both local and foreign armies. Uh, and in a way, this is kind of like a Baroque representation of, 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 of all the calamities that uh, Vilnius had encountered in the sort of uh, late 17th, early uh, first part of the 18th century. Uh, and the population truly dropped. Um, and uh, significantly. However, because probably the population dropped, the Jewish population in that period stabilized. If it didn't go down, there's none that stabilized. And, and Vilnius functioned 
uh, through that period as one of the most important Jewish city uh, in the region. Uh, and here again, the sort of kind of reminiscence perhaps of those of those dark century, if you want to call, of um, decline of Vilnius. Moshe Kuber writes uh, in, in the poetic verse, uh, you are a psalm inscribed upon the fields, a raven, assigned to you by the float of the moon. No sun has ever risen in Lithuania. Um, so nonetheless, as I mentioned, despite of the sort of decline, the city was still very much multicultural. And on the map of Europe, for example, around 700, it was presented as polyglossia. I know if you can see it, but Vilnius is the only one city that is sort of um, sign on this map, which was made in Venice, actually, a map of Europe with many, many names in, in different languages. So it's a kind of very clear indication that in the sort of, at least also in local, but also European mind, uh, this was this place. This was the place with different languages, different religions, uh, sort of function, perhaps independently, but also met each other. Now, in um, late 18th century description, points out to what the city was perhaps 100 years more ago. So, 100 years ago, uh, this is the uh, description of the professor of the Vilnius University, German uh, British naturalist Forster. A hundred years ago, Vilna had 800,000 inhabitants. Today, if one includes 12,000 Jews, it has only 20,000. So uh, from this description, obviously it's not necessarily very um, precise statistical description, uh, but nonetheless, it's probably more realistic, uh, is that the Jewish population is more than a half of the city. And this sort of having like probably 50% of the population, Jewish can, population or more, continue up until the Holocaust in, in Vilnius. Uh, so in a way for several centuries, uh, Vilnius was the city that uh, pretty much half, if not more of the population was Jewish. Um, so just to give you an example again of the Baroque presence, interestingly enough, or curiously enough, the more the city went to these sort of catastrophic destructions from all variety, the more it became sort of um, built with these magnificent Baroque buildings. So most of the Baroque buildings in Vilnius is from the 18th century. So it's kind of it's ironic that Vilnius that we see today is the sort of the most, uh, as I mentioned, this kind of like glorious Baroque city is the city in decline. And every, everybody who was traveling at the time to Vilnius would describe the sort of, uh, that the city was built basically with this kind of massive churches uh, was built and surrounded by ruins. Uh, so in a way it's, again, it's a kind of an interesting paradigm that the harder the time, so to speak, the more spectacular city becomes. And we can argue and, and discuss why that happened. But it's also interesting enough that, for example, the synagogue too, the great synagogue of Vilnius interior was completely uh, redone in, in a Baroque style in the 18th century. And again, tells you a lot um, to sort of by the influence between different religions that one architect specifically, Johann Christoph Glaubitz, uh, who designed these kind of churches and including the interior of the great synagogue. So he worked for Catholics, he worked for Protestants, he worked for Orthodox, and he worked for Jews. So all of those religious, all of those religious buildings have the sort of a touch of one architect, Christoph Glaubitz. So in a way, who was actually was not native of Vilnius, but became, uh, if you know, called, we want to call creator of Vilnius. And pretty much today's Vilnius is the in part is, is built in sort of by this kind of, uh, by the mindset of, of this architect. Uh, so 18th century also, it's full of this sort of kind of a, a Jewish legends about, about Vilna. One of them is about Gerd Sedek, who is a Polish uh, Lithuanian noble who converted to uh, Judaism and was because of that was burned um, at stake uh, in Vilnius. Uh, now, this is a legend probably, although there are some records of uh, 
of not burning some of that stake for that, but actually of, 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 of conversion into Judaism um, from local nobility. Uh, nonetheless, the, the legend grew so much that in the old Jewish cemetery, uh, there was a tree that supposedly grew, presumed the graves of, of, of Ram Gert Sedek. Actually, his ashes were buried there. Uh, to the point, the importance of that is to the point that the Polish soldiers in 1920 or something like that chopped that tree literally to sort of kind of uh, in the anti Semitic, uh, almost pogrom like attempt to squash this kind of narrative that somebody from the Polish nobility or Polish Lithuanian nobility could sort of adapt Judaism and became uh, a symbol, if you want to call, of, of Vilna Jews, one of the symbols. Now, the other very important symbol, of course, is the Vilna Gaon, uh, who lived through, through this period of, so to speak, of decline of at least uh, his early years from the period of decline. Uh, and, and the presence of Gaon shaped uh, the sort of the rest of the two centuries, if you want to call, of the development of Vilna. And this is from the Max Weindracht, who was the have the of Eva, the most important secular institution in in Vilnius in uh, in 1920s and 30s, which eventually was moved to New York. And here's this this is from the history of, of um, Yiddish language uh, quote. Uh, oh, sorry, cannot see the quotes. Uh, uh, there's no element of human conduct that is too trivial for the culture system of Jewishness. There are details, but not trifles. Therefore, traditional Jewishness is not religion. It is language, is not, and its language is not necessarily the language of religion, unless we say that all of life is religion. Even the geographical map of Jewishness is unique. Ashkenazi Jews is seemingly identical with Eastern Europe, but Vilna, thanks to Gaon, the masculine of the 19th century and the builders of the Yiddish of the 20th century will have to figure out on the map larger and larger letters than Vilnius, uh, Lithuanian Vilnius, Vilnia, for example, Polish or, or Russian Vilnius or Vilna Polish than on non-Jewish map. So in the way, in, well, in all of those um, narratives, Lithuanian narratives, Polish narrative, Vilnius stands a very important city, for example, Polish narrative, has that Vilnius is the kind of a, a city uh, of uh, northern Athens, Lithuania. This is where the beginning of the Lithuanian history and statehood, etc., is the heart of Lithuania. But in Jewish narrative, Vilnius stands even kind of like above all of those because it truly has a metaphysical essence. Uh, so here's the quick reminders, just put a little bit jump of the very important dates in, in, in Vilnius political life. So we kind of move now to the uh, the end of the 18th century where Vilnius was absorbed by, occupied by Russia and became uh, part of the Tsarist Russian and was administered as a sort of Russian Tsarist city. In, uh, then it was occupied for four years, um, for three years, I'm sorry, during World War I during, uh, Germ by Germans. Then we have Lithuanian and Polish independence, which literally fought uh, over Vilnius, so to speak. Uh, and in many ways, Vilnius and Vilnius was taken by Polish side and it was became Polish uh, city. Uh, however, from 1920 to 1930, it was sort of Polish city, Polish provincial city, but functioned also as a constitutional capital of Lithuania because it was declared by Lithuanian constitution to be the capital of Lithuania. Now, Lithuania and Poland, and this is actually quite important too to remember, was at war uh, almost all of this period. So in a way, the border between Vilnius and Poland was, uh, between, I'm sorry, Lithuania and Poland was completely um, uh, sealed off in many ways. And so there was no diplomatic relationship or something like that. So in a way, Lithuania, Vil Vilnius lost most of the, Part, part of sort of hinterland, which was sort of historical Lithuania. Then we have um, German occupation during World War II, uh, followed by and preceded and followed by the Soviet regime. And then in 1990, Lithuanian independence and finally Lithuanian joined in 2004 uh, European Union. 
So this is just to, to sort of a quicker reminder and put uh, in, way, in, in, in place. Now, another kind of important event, both in Jewish and sort of non-Jewish life of Vilnius was the uh, occupation of the French forces of Grand Grand Mayor of Vil uh, during the French invasion, Napoleonic invasion of, of Russia. Uh, and here's again description of the city who was living at that time. There were at the time about 35,000 uh, residents, which were actually assaulted by about half a million um, soldiers, uh, Grand Army of soldiers. So you can see how, how much of looting and everything was going on. On the retreat, however, uh, the Grand Army sort of completely sort of looted the city and um, and, and the city became de devastated. But here's it from 35,000 residents, about 11,000 were Jewish. Uh, and I think it's probably under undercounted. Uh, but anyway, so uh, it, again, it gives you sort of an idea, uh, the presence of, 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 of Jewish. However, already by that time, it was a Blanlich, as, as this another professor of University of Vilnius uh, writes, the Jews comprised a separate community whose local history was lost already, so to speak, in time. Meaning that it was already very well established with long traditions, Jewish community. Uh, now, um, it's important again to kind of remember that Vilnius was not sealed off during this period. Uh, and some of the gone, for example, followers um, resettle or settle in the, the land of Israel. And they reestablished the Kurva synagogue or the, what they call Rilun synagogue in the Jewish quarter of the old city of Jerusalem uh, by uh, sort of, and this uh, kind of the first, I, I believe that the Ashkenazi Jews sort of kind of establish um, synagogue in Jer Jerusalem. So in the way this kind of like was already established this connection between Vilnius and Jerusalem, not just kind of uh, imaginary, not just in religious terms or spiritual terms, but also in the kind of concrete, um, concrete forms of, of establishing, if you want to call Vilna diaspora there. Uh, but if you look from the, for example, both from the British and from the sort of a Jewish perspective, the Nothing compares to the visit of the Sir Moses Montefiore visiting Vilnius in 1846. Uh, now, Montefiore was, of course, uh, convinced that Jews could gain the goodwill, as in, in his biography is written, uh, that the Jews could gain the goodwill of the rulers and neighbors, in this case, Russians, by adopting the speech and customs of the surroundings, and that this would lead to an eventual emancipation. Now the problem, of course, in in Vilnius area, which which so to speak side you will take, perhaps that's the initial. Ru Russians were rulers, but the city and the Russian language uh, was uh, the ruling language. But the city was pretty much still Catholic, uh, which uh, Polish language, although oppressed, dominated um, the kind of cultural life or whatever. Not to mention that, of course, there were Lithuanians and Belarusians uh, living, if not necessarily in the city, but all the surrounding regions. So in the way the countryside language was either Lithuanian and Belarusians. Uh, and, and also the Jewish, in especially Yiddish, the Jewish language itself existed in this large region of uh, what, what later kind of a historians would describe as Yiddish land, right? The sort of like the region of mostly what we today consider to be Eastern Europe. So when, when Montefiore sort of tried to convey that the, the notion that Jews have to adapt to the, to the ruling uh, or to the, lang to the language and norms of the, of, of the sort of kind of like the powers, uh, in Vilnius case, it was not clear what those powers were, because in some ways, it's also a historic period, they were changing. That in itself actually allowed, probably that's one of the theory, allowed the, the sort of, kind of blossoming of Jewish culture in all variations. Obviously, the most strongest in Yiddish language, uh, but also in Hebrew. 
but also again in sort of kind of like you know in the, in in the languages of the and cultures of the of the sort of dominant uh, cultural religious groups, uh, Russian and to some extent Polish, and also in to German too. So in a way, Vilnius or Vilna, this Yiddish Jewish Vilna, if you want to call it, not Yiddish Jew, encompass all the different variations of, of being a Jew, of Jewishness too. Uh, so, so one of the, of course, in the 19th century symbol is the, the Vilna Shas, the printing of Vilna Shas that was printed by the widow Rom and the brothers. Uh, interestingly, I guess, and kind of like specifically enough that this publishing house was run by a woman in the 19th century. So hence the title widow Rom and brothers. Uh, and, and through that sort of publishing, through that printing, Vilna truly uh, spread, if you want to call Vilna word, truly spread all around, all around the world. With the Jewish diaspora, it spread all around the world. So um, Benjamin Harshev, uh, professor of, uh, of, of literature, of Slavic and Yiddish, or Jewish literature at uh, uh, Yale University, kind of described, compared interestingly enough, Vilna especially in this sort of Jewish aspect to Oxford and Cambridge as a cultural center serving immense hinterland. It's like, uh, so where people would come to the city, get sort of some kind of a cultural in the sort of a modernity, if you want, both in religious and modernity, and then would leave it. So, so hence the city of merely 660,000 Jews felt that it was a major center of a wild, wild culture. It was because of its cultural institutions and millions of Eastern Jews who they serve and present it. Now, you know, this audience obviously know that how much this kind of diaspora is uh, present in Leeds, for example, but there's all over the world. We have a uh, Vilna Schul, for example, in Boston, not to mention New York was very important, Central South Africa and Argentina, for example, and Brazil too. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it, we also have many diasporas of different Vilnius um, sort of other nationalities and other religions, both Catholic and sort of Orthodox, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of like Vilnius had different presence around all around the world, uh, depending on the sort of kind of, if you want to call denominational kind of um, uh, 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 sort of denominational uh, elements. Uh, but in um, in Vilnius excelled modernity, actually, interestingly enough, so this is the sort of the choral synagogue and Karite Sekinesa uh, that was presented in this Moorish similar style, as you can see. And choral synagogue was the sort of the modern synagogue, and also Karite Kinesa was considered to be a modern Kinesa too. So this is still uh, present in Vilnius. Uh, it, now, Germans during the First World War occupation institutionalized literally multilingualism. There are uh, five different languages officially functioning in the city. Uh, so German, Lithuanian, Belarusian written in Latin letters, uh, Polish, and Yiddish. So, and also this sort of awareness of old old traditions where also kind of like became to look at as a, with interest at that time in in both in Vilnius and outside. So traditional life, if you want to call, uh, became contrasted to the to the modern life. Uh, and the best example of that contrast is actually description of Alfred Dublin, who came to visit in 1925. And also, I could compare that to the description of um, uh, Lucy Davidovich, who visited the uh, stay in the city in 1939. Uh, so for Dublin, what was striking feature of the city was, was the sort of its modernity and, and, and specifically Jewish modernity. And in a way that he said that like, you know, the, the, I can see, I can hear, Jews around me, I can read the signs in Yiddish, but I don't notice them. And the reason why he doesn't notice is because specifically they are modern people, the same as he who came from Berlin. So those to speak metropolitan people. On the other hand, I mean, Lucy Davidovich certainly encountered that and live in that sort of modern city. 
She also said that this was the sort of a city, a storied place with a storied past. And um, I can tell that now probably I'm reaching the point where I should stop. I still would like to talk more perhaps about the 20th century, but we maybe that's a good, uh, good time for me to stop and have questions. And we'll discuss that if we have a few minutes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Linus. That's really been uh, really been fascinating. Um, even for me, having heard your talk before, uh, absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Um, we have a question from uh, Malcolm Adelstone. Before um, before I put that uh, to you, just if anybody else has a question to ask, now's a now's a good time. We have a few minutes left. So Malcolm is saying, do you have any idea of the geographic origin of the Vilna Jewish community prior to the 15th century? Well, I think there is still a... Oh, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I think there is a probably a debate and discussion. And I, uh, on the one hand, there's this theory that uh, Lithuanian Jews and presumably Vilna Jews who settled it in early parts, specifically if you if you look at this connection between the Karaites and Tatars who came from the Crimea, that they perhaps they are the Khazars who the sort of uh, people who were took Ju Judaism and I think in 9th and 10th century and they live in sort of what is today uh, Ukraine, southern Ukraine and southern Russian including Crimea. So that they are not necessarily Ashkenazi Jews who came from Germany via Poland, etc., but Khazars who came from much more so like kind of southern um, parts of, the, of Ukraine now. Uh, I don't know. I'm not an expert in that. So I think it's a probably nice and interesting theory. However, uh, it's very hard to prove because there's no evidence um, of that. And, and in a way, I, I, the records and probably by now some kind of genetic uh, uh, test could be done, DNA test or whatever, prove that most of the Jews who live in Lithuania uh, they're probably related to the Ashkenazi Jews who, who, of Poland and then, you know, Germany, et cetera, et cetera. So in the way uh, it was settled from the West, uh, interestingly enough, so the Jews in Lithuania settled from the West and then, uh, you know, kind of like spread all over the world, so to speak, so... Um, we have a question from Leon Collins, bearing in mind we don't have a huge amount of time left. He says, please Great. tell us a bit about the 20th century. Um, well, what I wanted to say about the 20th century, obviously that, and, and you know, you, you know that um, with, that the, the way the, how it, the city changed, and perhaps I'm just going to look quickly to, to show you them. I, can you see it? Not yet. Oh, to show this kind of demographical that, as I mentioned, for centuries, Vilnius or Vilna, you know, was sort of where Jewish population, it wasn't the dominant, but actually, you know, reaching the point of sort of 50 percent uh, after the Holocaust, of course, the, 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 that dramatically changed. And now I think it's probably no more than uh, about 2 percent or something like that, if not less, 1 percent, actually. Uh, so in a way, uh, I think the what what to me is the way you know the, we talk about Vilnius in Lithuania now as a very multicultural place, but we basically have no voices. Those multicultural voices are fewer and fewer and fewer. So in the way, it's a kind of a strange who is now can speak for this Jewish Vilna. Uh, uh, Lithuanians really sort of uh, spokespeople of, of, of this Jewish world, or uh, Jewish diaspora because there are very few Jews who still live in Lithuania. Although I have to say that this probably would be wrong to claim that um, culturally Vilnius still exists as a very important Jewish place and especially thanks to uh, cultural institutions that carry on that sort of kind of that tradition and especially like at the National Library and the sort of Vilnius connections to YIVO in New York. And so there is a growing understanding of the Jewish past in Vilnius among Lithuanians, but I still think it's the, it's the problem of the communication is the problem, so to speak, of translation is for Lithuanians, probably it's very difficult to imagine or to understand uh, the city. They 
their own city, so to speak, if it's half of the population speaks Yiddish, for example, it's that shapes and completely differently the way the city functions, Stephen, right? So. Okay, and as I'll explain in a moment, Linus will be back with us later on in the year where I'm sure he'll explore some of these themes in That's greater right. detail. We've got one more question I'll finish off with. It's from Anne Crook, uh, and Anne says, are there any records uh, commute of the Jewish community, for example, births, marriages, and deaths from around 1900? This is when um, her maternal grandfather came from uh, Vilna, uh, Vilnius to, to, to London. Uh, well, I'm not an expert, but yes, I mean, if um, I, I think because that would be the still sort of records archives of the Tsarist sort of period. So um, so I think some some of those records are, are now in the Lithuanian National Archives. So you probably can trace it and, and find it uh, there. I think it's the best way to contact, I think, that, you know, some organizations that that already kind of like know how to deal with that because you know they would be probably mostly in Russian language, et cetera. Uh, but there is a trick because if if people, for example, not necessarily born in Vilnius, but they were born in some towns or shtetls that now part of Belarus, uh, those those records could be much harder to access. So the records that sort of still related to Lithuania to I mean contemporary, uh, territory of Lithuania is pretty much uh, in Lithuania. Uh, but the records, for example, that is in Belarus, you, you know, that, that would be just in Belarus. So in a way, it's a tricky way to find out actual where, where they might deposit it, right? It's much easier, obviously, later from the 1920s and the sort of on, but the Tsarist period is still tricky. Well, very interesting to hear. And as I said, uh, Linus will be back with us. He's coming to Leeds on the 27th of February, um, and he will be speaking at the Leeds Library about Vilnius and libraries at 6.30 that evening. This is part of Leeds Lit Fest, part of Millim's contribution to Leeds Lit Fest and the uh, Leeds 2023 uh, Year of Culture. Now, just before we go, let me tell you a little bit about what we've got coming up. Uh, next week, we're pleased to welcome the novelist uh, Craig Sherman, and I'll be chatting to him about his debut novel, No Good Deed, which was recently published. He joins us from New Jersey, but he has some links uh, to Leeds, which uh, I'm sure he'll tell us all about. Then on the 23rd of January, uh, historian and author of British Jews in the First World War, Paula Kitching, returns to Millim, uh, and she'll be speaking about the uh, centenary of the British Jewry Book of Honour. And I know uh, there are some people within our community that have copies of that book, so that should be a fascinating presentation. Then on the 30th of January, I will be discussing all things about Joseph Roth with Kieran Pym, the author of Endless Flight, a new biography of the novelist and journalist. We have much more coming up, so please do visit our website at millim.org.uk. Uh, and sign up for our newsletter that way you'll be sure not to miss anything all events are free but we would appreciate a small donation there's a link in the chat or you can go to our website and this will help us with the cost of putting these events on it remains for me to thank our guest uh, linus Bradis once again thank you so much linus and well, thank uh, you. I'm it's looking awesome. forward to and it. And I promise that like the I'm coming in, I guess, in six weeks or something like that. Too. So it's going to be about a 20th century, that's for sure. So sounds fantastic. Be, well, we'll take you at your word. <laughs> and we're looking forward to seeing all of you again as a future event. Until then, stay safe. See you soon. Thanks.